of those who seek him. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Okay, so Moses was born. He was hidden for three months because of the king's edict of some sort and they hid him because he wasn't beautiful. I think we ought to go back and actually read that story. So let's go back to Exodus. Genesis, Exodus. Exodus 1. We're going to talk about Moses for like the next six weeks. So we're going to get lots of Moses, which means we're going to sing Grace's favorite song. Go down, Moses. Way down. Isn't that how it goes? Something like that? Yeah. So we're going to sing that. So Exodus 1, we're going to start in verse 6. Exodus 1, verse 6. It says, Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. Who was Joseph? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Remember, we were talking about Joseph right here in this very room just a couple weeks ago. When Joseph was in Egypt, what was his job? Assistant to Pharaoh. Assistant to Pharaoh, second in command. When Joseph got buried, think pyramid. Okay, don't think wooden box in a potter's field. Think pyramid. All right, he was a dude. All right, so Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful increased greatly, multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they would multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. Now, uh, quiz question, really quick. How many years passed between Joseph and Moses? Anybody have any idea? 400. About 400 years. About 400 years. So these, these uh, uh, sons of Israel that the scriptures are referring to, they grew up in Egypt. They were born in Egypt. They don't know Israel. They don't know the promised land. Okay, all they know is that they have a DNA line that's different from their neighbor. They're Egyptian. They just happen to be Hebrew. Does that make sense? They, this is uh, this is this is World War II Hitler uh, uh, Jew stuff. I mean, this is we don't like you because you have a different blood link than we do. Even though you're not a threat, in the sense we're all living in the same community. But since you're different from us, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to oppress you, exterminate you. That's what this is. Verse 11, so they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, uh, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out so that they were, they were in dread of the sons of Israel. Now, the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. I love it when I hear the, the, the smart people where they go, I wonder who built the <coughs> to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field, and their labors which were rigorously imposed on them. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other was named Pua, and he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and you see them upon the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall put him to death, but if it's a daughter, then they, then they shall live. You guys understand the king's edict right here. Okay. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? And the midwives straight up lied to Pharaoh. It doesn't really say that, but this is exactly what they did. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as Egyptian women, they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. So God, <laughs> check out verse 20. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Because the midwives feared God, and he established households for them. Very fascinating couple of verses.
verses right there. <laughs> Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. So cast into the Nile didn't mean you are to kill the child and throw a dead body into the Nile. What it meant was you send it into the Nile, whatever happens, happens. Does that make sense? It's like you're giving it to the gods, that kind of thing. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. House of Levi, in, in, for Hebrews, means what? Priesthood. Priesthood. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. Okay. The woman conceived and bore a son, she saw that he was beautiful. Beautiful child. Beautiful. Hid him for three months. When she denied him, no longer she got him a wicker basket, covered it over with tar and pitch, which would make it waterproof, and then she put the child in it, and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. So in other words, she didn't like send it down the center. She like hid it over here. Um, now there's a whole bunch to the three months and what all of that can mean. And I, I don't have time to go into all of that kind of stuff. So the, the question, well, let me tell you, let, let's, let's pick up one more thing. Let's go to Acts. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. So in Acts chapter 7, uh, just to give you a little bit of context here, um, this is, so Stephen was like the first deacon of the new church, and Stephen gets arrested, uh, basically for being a Christian and doing his job, and, and he's being arrested, not by the Romans, he's being arrested by the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jewish church people, and he gives like the greatest smackdown speech in the history of speeches to them, and it's recorded in uh, Acts chapter 7. And part of this speech, he's, he's kind of doing a history to give a context. And in this history, uh, in verse 17, he says, But at the time of the promise was approaching, as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, until there arose another king over Egypt who, not, who knew nothing about Joseph. Okay, that takes us right back to where we were in Exodus 1. So we kind of get back to the same story. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. Sending them down the Nile. Are you guys with me? Okay. And, he, uh, and after he had been set outside, uh, Pharaoh's, oh, verse 20. It was that time that Moses was born and he was lovely in the sight of God and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. After he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him and as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. So let me get this straight. Because the baby was good looking, they hit him. I mean, it says that in three places, right? In one place, you might be able to mount a creative argument that I would listen to some. In two places, I'm already tuning you out. In three places, I'm saying, how do you argue with that? <laughs> so, so now the question becomes, what does that even mean? Does that mean Moses was so good looking? As, okay, I don't want, I don't, Lexi, I don't want others to be mad at you. Okay, so just... <laughs> Ancient cultures felt that physical beauty was a 
personal touch of God. So if if someone was born with with beautiful, magnificent physical features, it was God's direct favor. Now our culture has a touch of that. We don't we're, we don't need to go down that road, but you know what I mean. We have a touch of that. Um, so Moses was born so amazing that his mom was like, hand of God. Pharaoh's daughter, which she opened up the wicker basket with, hand of God. You don't think Pharaoh knew this was a Hebrew child that his daughter was raising in the palace? Really? Really? Pharaoh looked the law, the rules, the custom were orchestrated where God couldn't raise somebody up. And God made a way where there wasn't a way. And so Moses was so beautiful that he circumvented whatever the rules and stuff were to bring about God's plan and agenda in a culture that was allied that that's our role in this culture. Our role is to be Moses. When you give your life to... Okay. Anybody been watching the Olympics? I, I promise I'm not going to go long here. Anybody been watching the Olympics? Okay. Man, they can run. Some of the girls, some of the dudes, man, they can fly, right? Uh, all people are created equal. It doesn't look like it at, at the Olympics. <laughs> I've watched some of those races where where uh, the, the runner that wins is a half lap ahead of, and I think that dude or that girl's in the Olympic finals, and they got destroyed. All men are created equal. What does that mean? All men are created equal. Because it doesn't mean physically. Moses was more beautiful than anybody else. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean intellect. We could probably list all the things that it doesn't mean. I'm looking for the one thing it does mean. We are all creating God's image. Yes. To yes. Serve him. With, to serve him, which means, here's, here's the equal part, we are all eligible to receive God. Doesn't mean we all receive God. It means we're all eligible to receive God. Because we're created in his image. The intention of you is to be a vessel that houses God. You ever think about it that way? The intention of you is not to be a vessel that houses other junk. It's to house God. It's to do godly things. It's to be a representative of God here on earth to do his will. Does that make sense? So all men are created equal means you're eligible for that. Doesn't mean you're going to receive it. That's up to you. God did his part. He made you eligible. Amen? Amen. I got to stop or I'm never going to stop. Now you got to put in the work. Yep. What's that? Now you have to put in the work. Yeah, now you have to put in the work. You got to put in a desire. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to transition to the courtyard uh, for baptisms. Now, here, here's what this is going to look like. If you want a chair, bring it. If uh, you want to stand, you're more than welcome to stand. Um, it's going to take us just a little bit to, we're going to move communion out there. Uh, uh, where's Mark? Mark, Mark, you got a nice robe for you. You and I are going to be almost twins. Uh, Bell, he's back there. Okay, I got a little robe for him if he wants. If he wants to go swimsuit, I'm fine with that too. Um, and it's going to be chaos and all of that, but we'll kind of pull it together. <clears throat> um, Bo, on the counter, when we into the kitchen, there is a, a brown box. And on in that brown box is a copy of all the liturgy that we'll do outside. Uh, you and Ron and, and whoever else, let's just get it handed out to everybody so everybody's got, knows what we're doing. Does that make sense? Um, any questions? Here's what this isn't. This isn't a smoke break. Okay, this isn't time to go to the car and check messages. This is let's move that direction so we can prepare and do baptisms. You guys good? You good? All right. Lord in heaven, I love you. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to do your will. Lord, thank you that we are eligible to receive your grace, to receive your mercy, to receive your love, and to receive your power to walk in your footsteps. Lord, I pray for the baptisms that are forthcoming. Lord, I, I, I know you're there. I know you're ready. Lord, I pray that it is amazing things. In your name, amen. All right.